We're going to start by taking you to Egypt. So here we are in uh, 1924, and this is a picture, um, a photograph taken in 1924, and the photo was taken just as the archaeologists that had been digging for weeks opened a tomb that had not been opened. This door that you can see here leads into a, a secret burial chamber and it had been hidden uh, and it had not been opened for 3,000 years. And it was the burial chamber of one of the most famous archaeological discoveries ever, uh, King Tutankhamun, I'm sure you've heard his name. So, uh, he was a pharaoh of Egypt. I mean, a pharaoh means sort of the sort of king or emperor of Egypt at the time, ancient Egypt. And this is what was written by, I thought I'd, I'd show you this, this is what was written by Howard Carter, who is this guy here, as he entered the tomb. This is what he wrote in his sort of, in his journal. At first I could see nothing, the hot air escaping from the chamber, causing the candle flame to flicker. But presently, as my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues, and gold. Everywhere the glint of gold. So he went into this tomb. The darkness cleared and he could start to see gold everywhere. Now then, so this is in 1924. Um, anyone uh, notice anything about the, the photograph here? I wonder if anyone, uh, anyone can spot anything about the photo there. <laughs> I don't think the doors to the tomb were made of gold. The doors to the tomb were made of stone. But uh... this photo is from nineteen twenty-four. Has anyone? Uh... Yes, Tutankhamun was about one and a half thousand years before Queen Cleopatra, Sophie, so... Um, uh, so really, like, Queen Cleopatra would have been thinking of Tutankhamun kind of a little bit like we think of uh, Queen Cleopatra, like, a thousands of years ago. There are images on the door. They're hieroglyphics, that's right. Egyptian form of writing is picture form. Nobody's noticed anything suspicious about that photo from 1924. Ah, Freddie's got it. Well done, Freddie. Win yourself a pencil. Dylan was pretty close behind, but Freddie was the first. Yes, this is a, a colour photograph. And um, it's, it was originally in black and white. The photograph was originally in black and white. But these days, with technology, they can go through and it's called colorizing photographs, which it really brings them into life. So you see loads of black and white photos from a long time ago, perhaps the First World War and so on, and it really brings it to life and sort of connects us a little bit closer to um, those times if you see them in color. So the color has kind of been done afterwards, but it is amazing when you see these things. So well done, Freddie. Prize there, Dylan was close second. So anyway, what did they see inside Tutankhamun's tomb? Let's have a look. So, this is the most famous photograph here. It is Tutankhamun's, they found a mummy of Tutankhamun buried in what's called a sarc sarcophagus, which is like a coffin, with on top of it a death mask. So this was his death mask laid out over the top. And the death mask, like many other things inside the tomb, was made of solid gold, which means it was very heavy but it was incredibly, in incredibly good condition. It was sh completely shiny, as shiny as the, the day it had been made, which is one of the reasons why gold is, is so precious. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, oh Dylan, that's true. His, they, now that's really interesting. Did you know that his mask wasn't actually made for him? Inside the mask, this was only discovered in the last 10, 15 years, inside the mask, on the on the sort of inside of the face, there's a little inscription that's of a queen which who was queen of Egypt about 20 years before um, Tutankhamun. And her name is kind of like half written into the mask, and then it's actually rubbed out, or has been erased. So, um, so you're right, uh, Dylan, he died early, so it's his mother's mask. So... There's a theory that it might have been actually made for his mother, um, but then because he died, um, 
at the age of 17 under mysterious circumstances they gave the mask to him instead so uh, also there's a theory that he um, well we don't know quite what he looked like because inside the sarcophagus is his mummified body which obviously is a diff bit difficult to, to decide what his face looks like but with modern reconstructions they are trying to recreate what his face looked like from his bone structure yeah that's a good knowledge there Dylan obviously you know a bit about uh, Tutankhamun uh, apparently he became king at the age of 8 or 9 and he was 17 when he died but I could be could be wrong Sienna that's just what I read there so uh. now then so let's just try and place where he is so we've been talking for so the last couple of lessons so we talked about the discovery of copper in on Wednesday's lesson and that was around 6000 BCE which remember is 8,000 years ago because you have to go back 2,000 years to go back to the year zero from here. So 6,000 BC to about 4,000 is the copper age when people were making copper items. Then we looked at Utzi, the ice man, who had a copper axe and he was just starting to go into the bronze age. Now bronze, remember, is a um, copper alloy, which means they have added some other metals to the copper to make it stronger. So for then the next 2000 years, you had something called the, the Bronze Age, which is basically copper, but strengthened copper because they added an extra metal to it. And Tutankhamun was king of Egypt just near the end of the Bronze Age. So between one and 2000 years BCE, before the common era. So he was coming to the end, the end of the Bronze Age and he lived in a kingdom which was incredibly rich. Look at all this gold he had around him. He had, uh, Egypt was the richest kingdom in the world at the time. The emperors were like gods and they had anything that they wanted and they were buried with incredible treasures. Actually, Tutankhamun's tomb was um, one of the only tombs that had never been discovered and raided by tomb raiders. So tomb raiders were pretty common for imagine 3,000 years, people were hunting and they knew that there were a lot of treasures and so on in these hills where um, Tutankhamun was buried and most of the tombs had been opened and raided. But uh, Tutankhamun's tomb was one of the only ones still to have the original gold left in it. Anyway, so here's, um, here's a, a picture of Egypt. Now I want to try and explain why Egypt was so rich. So basically, Egypt is a country, and it still is today, but it was 3,000 years ago as well, that was uh, mostly built around the River Nile. River Nile is the longest, or at least tied with the Amazon, River Amazon in Brazil, as the longest two rivers in the world. So the River Nile goes all the way down here, and the capital where um, Tutankhamun was found is here, called uh, a place called Luxor today, but it used to be called Thebes, when it was the capital. And down this river, came washing nuggets of gold. Thousands of nuggets of gold came washed down from this river. Because in the mountains here in Sudan, you can see here just at the bottom of the map, these were mountains that had a lot of gold in. And as the rain poured and rivers and streams poured through the mountains, the nuggets were washed down the river here. So the Egyptians were literally picking up gold out of the river. Imagine having gold nuggets running past your house. You're like, oh, I'll have some of that gold, please. Yes, thank you very much. So this country was incredibly rich with gold. They were worldwide known for how much gold they were. They had. And unlike, you know, remember when we talked about copper back in Israel and Jordan? That's where a lot of the Malachite was found. That's what we talked about in Wednesday's lesson. Unlike copper, which is found as an ore, which means that it is copper attached to other elements, um, oxygen and carbon in the case of Malachite, gold is not found as an ore. Gold does not like to get together as a compound with other elements. It just exists as pure gold, nothing else. Which means that it looks exactly the same whether you've just got it out of the ground or whether you've made it into like a piece of jewelry or something like that. It just looks shiny and gold, that gold color. It doesn't look any different when you just pick up a piece of gold out of the river. So, Hi Lily. Yes, we are going to do a lesson on Monday, I think so. Um, we'll talk about, talk about what we've got coming up as well. So, is copper ever washed up? Um, so, most metals come as ores, which means that when you dig them up out of the ground, they're already attached to something different. So, like copper with carbon and oxygen makes 
an ore called malachite. And it doesn't look like a metal until you've smelted it. Remember smelting where you melt it down and then you use it with charcoal to, to extract the other elements. Most metals come like that as an ore. You dig them up and they look like a rock, maybe with a coloured rock or something like that. But gold is exceptional. Gold does not like to join up with um, any other elements, oxygen and carbon. So gold exists as a, like a pure metal there. All right. Which means you don't even have to do anything with it. It's just gold straight out of the ground. If you pick up some gold, you can make it into a necklace straight away. Don't, no smelting necessary. Did they wait for the lake to dry out, Dylan? No. Well, they, they probably did something called panning, which means that they sifted through the sand and the... Um, sand and the gravel at the bottom of the riverbed. So we went to a shallow part of the river, picked up some gravel, and then sifted through it to see whether they could find some gold nuggets. I'll put a link to the to how panning works. Uh, I'll put a little video at the end of the slides for this lesson. So you can have a look at it. So anyway, e Egypt was the richest kingdom in the world because of this gold that was washing down the river here. Uh, this is a picture of, um, this is a picture from a different tomb, actually a different king's tomb. But this depicts, here's these Egyptians here. These are the, the masters and they have slaves. So there's a, a big slave society, Egypt. Um, they, we think they use thousands of slaves to try to build the, the pyramids, which is probably one of the most recognizable things, um, landmarks in Egypt. But these slaves here were used to, they, we think in this picture, they are in a, in a gold mine and they are being used to to mine gold for then the Egyptians and the, the kings to use. So this is a picture showing how they might have used the gold or obtained the gold. Anyway, so let me just like catch up with you a little bit here. So at the time of the Egyptians, the Egyptians knew about seven different metals. And let's just review where we're at. So we're about, about 1,500 BCE, which means that um, we're at the end of the Bronze Age, okay? So I've put up here the, the metals that the Egyptians knew about and their names and their chemical symbols. So do you remember on the periodic table, everything's got a chemical symbol? Do they have a crafting table? <laughs> so, well, I'll tell you what, Ollie, if you take copper, which copper was like metal number one. Everybody knew about copper. And you could craft copper if you added some tin or some lead, you could craft it into copper alloys, which was even more useful than copper. Does anyone want to tell me why the alloys were even better than copper? So why was something like bronze, which is a copper alloy, even more useful for making tools and axes and so on than just 100% copper? What's good about alloys, guys? No, mercury. Mercury is a, a metal that also come from an, came from a rock, came from an ore, but it was really easy to obtain, really easy to heat up. You didn't need to heat it up from very much. Mia, you are absolutely right. Um, well done. I've given Mia a pencil there. You've earned your prize. So when you when you added when you made copper alloys, so by adding tin or lead to the copper, you could make it stronger. That's right, guys. Well done. Me got there first for that one. So, uh, so bronze, for example, was a copper alloy that was used for a thousand years during the Bronze Age, and it was just better than regular copper because it was stronger, harder, and longer lasting. So that was copper. That was copper. They added some tin, added some lead, and made these bronze alloys. Let me just write down Mia's name for her prize. I'm writing it down with, with the, the pencil that you have actually won, Mia. Now then, uh, mercury, the Egyptians knew about mercury, mercury, ancient people knew about mercury, but they, uh, but it was poisonous. Mercury would uh, send you out of your mind. You would go insane if you touched too much mercury. Uh, and so it was regarded as highly dangerous. And also it's not, you can't build much stuff out of mercury because it's liquid, it, it melts at room temperature. So. It's not exactly useful for making tools and so on. Okay, so copper was the, the thing. 
Gold and silver were much more rare, so you were you didn't, they were difficult to find, except in Egypt, which they seemed to have loads of gold. But gold and silver were valuable, so because they were really rare, and also because they were uh, they they were incredibly shiny. Um, unlike some of these tin and lead, they looked really shiny, and they never reacted with anything. So they didn't uh, rust, or um, as they got old, ancient gold does not uh, change its uh, colour or its um, shininess as it goes on. We'll talk about that in a minute. All right. Now, has anyone noticed anything a bit weird about this slide here that I've put up on the on the screen? The seven metals of the ancient world. Gold and silver not so useful because um, they were a lot softer than copper actually, especially softer than bronze. So gold and silver are not exactly great for building tools and stuff out of, but they were just um, rare, pretty and precious. So a bit like Charlie. <laughs> Has anyone noticed anything about the screen that I've got here? Oh, Caden. Well spotted. Caden got there just before Mikey. There are only six metals here. Now, the ancient world, there was a seventh metal that was regarded as the... Let me just write down Caden's name here. There was a seventh metal, which was... More expensive than gold, more expensive than silver, more valuable than any of the other metals because it was so rare. Any of the other metals that were up here. Um, I bet nobody can guess what it is actually. <laughs> it is, well, first of all, just if anyone can guess what it is. Oh, Blizzard! Who's Blizzard? <laughs> you weren't here yesterday, Blizzard. Who's Blizzard? I'm going to write down Blizzard here. Uh, diamonds, diamonds and emeralds are not um, are not pure metals, Sydney. We might talk about gemstones in a different lesson, actually. Gemstones would make quite a cool lesson to look at. Diamonds, emeralds, rubies and sapphires and so on. All right. No, no. So, Blizzard, you're right, it's iron. Now, I uh, just wanted to mention about, so a quick mention about these symbols. Some people have asked me about the symbols, the, the different elements. Basically, all of these symbols of the ancient world metals come from their Roman names. So, uh, they don't come from their English names, because the Romans knew about these, and Romans used a language called Latin. Um, all of the chemical symbols we use today come from their Roman names. So, uh, Romans called copper cuprum, C-U-P-R-E-U-M, cuprum. Uh, they had a name Stanum for tin. Uh, lead was called plumbum, which is a bit weird because uh, the Romans made all of their sewage systems and their fresh water pipes out of, uh, so bringing water to their houses out of lead piping. Lead was a really soft, easy metal to make into pipes. And that's where we get our word for plumber or plumbing today from the Roman word for plumbum, which means lead. Um, mercury was uh, known in Roman times as hydrogyrum, so HG, hydrogyrum, and that means um, uh, that means watery silver or water silver, because they was it was they thought it was liquid silver, or they also had a name called quicksilver for it. Uh, gold, by the, in the Roman times, was called aurum, A U R U M, aurum, and finally silver was called Argentium, so it has the symbol AG at the end of it. Argent. So all of these names come from Latin. Nobody speaks Latin anymore. It's kind of like a like a language that's uh, you know even in Italy they don't speak Latin. They they speak um, Italian, but Latin is kind of like a, a link to a lot of the languages we use today. So there's still quite a lot of Latin in because it's you know an ancient language that stemmed quite a lot of our languages today. Anyway, so the seventh metal here. Here it is, iron. Iron was more valuable than all of these other metals and more rare than all of these other metals. And I'm going to show you how that links to King Tutankhamun right now. Iron had the, uh, the Roman name Ferrum, which uh, uh, gives it a symbol Fe. 
Why did we change the words to Mercury? Um, I don't know that actually, Sophie. So, so why don't we call it Hydrogyrum? Um, where the English term for Mercury comes from, I'm not too sure about. So uh, I'll have to have to try and find out. <laughs> All right. So iron was newly discovered, and it made the seventh metal of the ancient world. Now I want to show you this. So. King Tutankhamun was buried with. Why was iron more valuable? Now this is, I'm gonna try and explain there and why it was more, can you imagine a piece of iron, like a paperclip, being more valuable than its weight in gold? And that's what it was like back in Egypt. And it was so valuable that King Tutankhamun was buried with two priceless daggers by his side and this one here was made of solid gold, so a solid gold dagger. And this one here was made of solid iron. And can you guess which one Tutankhamun regarded more, or which one was his favorite dagger? Which one was his more precious dagger? It was the iron one here. So the, the, it was written that gold was um, referred to as the flesh of the sun god. So the Egyptians had a sun god, Ra, and they loved a bit of gold. So, but that was more common in Egypt. Iron was extremely rare in Egypt, and they called it a gift from the heavens. So imagine this iron blade here. Now when Tutankhamun's uh, um, uh, tomb got opened, they had no idea that this iron blade, or they didn't even know that Egyptians knew about iron. They didn't know that um, Egyptians had discovered iron. And here's the reason why. This is to do, it's to do with where this blade comes from. And so I'm going to show you a video clip here, as usual. When I show you a video clip, I'm going to mute my mic, but I'll still be talking, uh, typing in chat instead. So, uh, so this is about the story about these two daggers here and where the iron came from. So in 2016, they studied King Tut's dagger and discovered that it was likely to be made out of meteorite iron. They used what's called an XRF spectrometer to determine the nature of the metal that was used. Because iron was not exactly well used during the Egyptian period, especially during King Tut's rule, which was 1300 BC. To find meteorite iron used in ancient Egypt, that's well before when we were regularly using irons as humans. That's when we would call the Iron Age. The ancient Egyptians were much more in the Bronze Age, where we were working mostly with bronze and metals like that. So it was very uncommon to find iron. The composition was 89% iron, 11% nickel, and the remainder was cobalt. Now, anybody who knows anything about meteorites knows that they have a high nickel content. But the problem with this is that meteorites are very difficult to fashion into objects. Very, very brittle, very difficult to work with. One of the challenges with getting iron out of a meteorite and mining it is really the composition of the iron will be spread out perhaps throughout the meteorite, maybe not clustered. You have to find it and you have to get it from the meteorite. One of the qualities that makes this dagger so unique and has brought a lot of attention onto it is the way that it was created. It has no hammer marks on it. It's completely smooth. It has a nice edge all the way around on it. It doesn't display all the telltale signs of iron working from that time period. So where did the blade come from? Did the Egyptians make it? If the ancient people were looking at the sky for extraterrestrials, and then essentially a, a sort of a present was sent to them in the form of meteoric iron. This would have been something just so valuable to them and auspicious because it was literally coming from heaven. So guys, there's your answer. Iron was incredibly rare because they hadn't dug it out of the ground. Where they got the iron from, it had landed as a meteorite from space. So in, meteorites from space don't just land very often. And the iron that King Tutankhamun's dagger was made from was made out of meteorite rock. So it had come from a, perhaps another planet or come from 
um, asteroid belts which are way out into space. And then it landed somewhere in Egypt. We think it was about 200 miles away from the capital Thebes. And they, somebody had gone to collect this rock here um, and they'd found the iron inside the rock, which is incredible really. And that's why it was so rare. They were not mining iron and they were not digging up iron out of the ground. They had come and they collected it, exactly George, they collected it from the sky. So they thought it had been sent by their gods. That's why they called it... Um, that's why they called it a gift from the heavens, because the iron was so rare, because meteorites landed like once every 100 years or so or something, and, you know, it was incredibly rare to get that iron there. All right? No, it wasn't the same meteorite that killed the dinosaurs, but uh, um, that's, uh, that's another st a story for another lesson, I think. So Anyway, so iron was not dug out of the ground. And I just want to, this is the last thing for today's lesson, really. So iron, exactly, iron dropped from the, from, not exactly from the gods, came, but they thought it came from the gods, so uh, it came from, came from space. So one of the weird things is that the Egyptians, they thought that iron was incredibly rare, but actually iron is more common than copper on planet Earth. There's more of, more iron on planet Earth than there is of copper. And the only thing was that nobody at the Egyptians' time knew how to get it out of iron ore. So this is iron ore here. It looks like a kind of reddish sort of rock. It's called hematite. And nobody knew that iron was in there. So it's the, the last slide for today before I give you the quiz. And this is, the, this is like why iron was never, never uh, sort of like used by the Egyptians. They knew how to get copper, and copper had been got for thousands, you know, a couple of thousand years during the Bronze Age. People had been mining copper, getting the copper out of the, the copper ore, and then using it to make bronze items. They knew how to make gold, or to obtain gold, because it was just free in the river, and it was gold already. You didn't need to do anything with the gold, because look at this, gold does not come attached with any other elements at all. Whereas iron... Look at this, this is the iron ore. It comes with Fe2, which means two atoms of iron, and O3, which means three atoms of oxygen. So iron was joined up together with oxygen to make this iron ore. And nobody had the knowledge or the secret, or nobody had worked out how to separate out the pure iron out of iron and oxygen. Copper comes as an ore of copper, Cu, carbon, which is the letter C, and three atoms of oxygen. And people had found the secret for getting pure copper away from the carbon and the oxygen. That was called smelting, when you heat it up with charcoal. We learned about that in lesson you know, on Wednesday's lesson. And you could heat it up with charcoal and get the pure copper out of it. But nobody had the secret of getting iron out of uh, the iron ore. It was more difficult, especially because iron atoms, they like to hold on to the oxygen atoms. They're more strongly bonded to hot oxygen atoms. So Tutankhamun had one of the only iron daggers in the world because it had fallen straight from a meteor as iron or pure iron. But nobody else had any iron stuff because uh, nobody had invented a way yet of getting the iron out of this rock here, which was very common on planet Earth. So copper could be smelted, and you could get pure copper. Gold did not need to be smelted because it was already pure gold when it was found in the river. And, well, Dylan, you need to smelt stuff if you need to get rid of the other elements which are attached to the metal. So copper comes attached with carbon and oxygen, like I already said. So you need to smelt it, heat it up with charcoal to get the pure copper. Gold does not come to attached it doesn't come attached with any other elements with oxygen or carbon or anything so you don't need to smelt it it's pure gold already and iron comes attached with oxygen and you can't get it away from the oxygen it's really difficult to get it away from the oxygen so iron atoms hold on to their oxygen atoms more, more strongly and it's more difficult to separate out the iron but it was coming guys the invention was coming when people worked out how to separate out iron, it was like the wonder metal. It was the best metal that humans had ever discovered. So the Iron Age was on its way after the Bronze Age. 
So it's yellow and shiny already. That's right. That's right. But it's, a, it's it's called gold is gold is called a pure element. So when it's only one element, it's just gold on its own. That's called a pure element. Whereas copper comes as a compound and iron comes as a compound, which means it's joined up to other elements and it doesn't come out straight as pure copper. It doesn't come out straight as pure iron. It comes out as, you know, uh, comes out as uh, compounds, and you have to get rid of the other elements to get to the get to the pure metal. All right, good questions, guys. Good questions. Uh, how long did it take for them to discover Sienna? Well, let me just go back on my little timeline here. So that's a good, good question. So let me go back to the timeline. So Tutankhamun was living at the end of the Bronze Age here. And this was around about 2000 BC, and he was king of Egypt around about 1300 BC, so around about here. Now, towards the end of the Bronze Age, somewhere around about here, a few people start to discover the secrets of how to extract iron and make iron objects from iron, the rocks in the ground, the iron ore. And that started off the next age, which was called the Iron Age. And that was, so that was around about 1000, 1000 BC. So that's how that when we're talking about the discovery. So that's for next lesson though. The Iron Age will be coming next lesson. Um, we'll be talking about how good iron was and what people started to make out of iron and the secrets to extracting iron from the ground. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff about iron, which is uh, which is really cool. But we'll be doing that next week, I think, on the next uh, the next lesson. So what have we looked at today? So today we have looked at the uh, discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, which was full of gold items, which he was, which shows how rich Egypt was as a country. Egypt had that amount of gold because the gold was washing down from the mountains of Sudan in the sediments, that means the gravel and sand at the bottom of the River Nile, and people could just pan it out of the, out of the river. The tombs and coffins were made generally of carved stone, Erin, the doors and the tombs. But then there was an incredible amount of gold um, and all kinds of other treasures that they thought Tutankhamun might want to take to the, the afterlife. So they, they believed he would have a second life um, in the afterlife and he would need a load of stuff to take with him. Then we talked about um, how the ancient world knew about seven different metals. So this, the copper, things they used to make copper alloys, which is bronze, tin and lead. Mercury, which was poisonous and not very useful at all, and the precious metals, and then finally the um, iron, which was discovered initially straight from meteorites. Talked about his two daggers. The iron one was the more valuable one because nobody knew how to make iron at this time, unless it had come from space, which was pretty rare. And then finally, why iron was not widely used during the Bronze Age and that's because it is difficult to extract from its ore. So it's difficult to get the pure iron out of this rock here because you can't separate it from the oxygen. All right, so that's what we've looked at today. Hope you've enjoyed today's lesson. Um, uh, uh, at the end of the slides here, I'm gonna link you the slides, but at the end of the slides, I have um, a little video here on people panning for gold. If you're interested in how you get gold or you'd like to try panning for gold in, um, uh, the stream at the bottom of your back garden or something like that so you can uh, you can try this for yourself um, if you come back to school rich because you've discovered an enormous gold deposit then you know just give me a little small percentage as a thank you for showing you how to do this lesson so um, uh, there's a little clip here on uh, on panning for gold which you can watch if you if you're interested how it's done they're doing it in Canada here up near Alaska